Hi everybody, this is Rizwan Chowdhury and welcome to uh, Chats with Chaudhry. I'm delighted to be joined by Martin Lush, uh, Global VP of NSF Health Sciences, uh, Pharmaceutical, Biotech and Medical Devices. And today, Martin's going to talk to you about how companies can best cope with the current situation. So, Martin, first of all, lovely to meet you. I hope you're well. Thanks, Rizwan. Very well, thanks. Great. And uh, before we start talking about um, how companies can cope in this current situation with COVID-19, I think it'd be useful for viewers just to get a bit of an idea of your background and a little bit about NSF International as well, if we can. Okay, very quickly, Rasman. And firstly, apologies for my COVID <laughs> headache. I mean, I think this is uh, probably one of many, but just very briefly, I've been working in the healthcare sector for over 40 years. I started off my career in the health service for 10 years. I was a medical microbiologist, specializing very much in infection control, diagnosis. So I come from that, that, that kind of bacterial viral background, if you like. Then went into pharmaceuticals with ICI, which then became AstraZeneca, where I was involved um, both in the quality assurance and the manufacture of aseptic products, uh, so injectables. So I'm, uh, I'm a qualified person but actually ended my days in AZ in manufacturing of aseptics. I have a lot of experience in monoclonal antibodies, vaccines, anti-cancer drugs, uh, et cetera. And then joined a very small consultancy called David Begg Associates, um, which then became um, NSF. We were bought by NSF. And NSF is a not-for-profit organization uh, with, with um, global presence in, across all five continents. And our mission really is to improve the health of people. So we have divisions in food, we have divisions in water, in dietary supplements, and I lead the health sciences division, which is responsible for pharmaceuticals, medical devices, offering training, education, consultancy, support and advice across, across the globe. Right, okay, cool. Well, look, let's talk about the subjects that you know, we're here to talk about today, which are, Firstly, what do you think are the main issues COVID-19 has exposed in the farmer environment? And what I, think it's exposed, <coughs> I, think, I think it's exposed an awful lot as one. I think what, it, what is exposed is farmers' ability when it wants to, to innovate quickly right. and innovate at speed and at scale. So, you know, if you look at what... Uh, the levels of collaboration that historically has never happened before. I think it's great to see because big pharma in particular has really bad press. You know, you ask the average person in the street about big pharma, yeah. it, you know, it's largely treated with, with disdain. And I think the great thing COVID-19 has, has exposed is farmers' ability to innovate at scale. You know, if you look at what, you know, Jane j have committed $1 billion to, you know, to expand their manufacturing capabilities for, for vaccines to manufacture it not for profit. So I think it's been a great opportunity for Big Pharma in particular to show what role it can play in society. I think it's also exposed, and I love the quote from Madeleine Albright years ago, which is very applicable to pharmaceuticals. You know, we are an industry driven by 21st century science, governed by 19th century minds. Uh, regulate sorry 20th century minds regulated by 19th century laws so i think it's exposed you know in, in in all of my time in pharmaceuticals the statistics have remained the same it takes 10 to 15 years to bring a new medicine to to market uh 90 percent of them fail at a cost of 1.2 billion per medicine um and, and that's just not a sustainable business model and that has to change i think the last thing COVID is really, and this for me is the most important. What COVID is exposed is how vulnerable each one of us are to um, infective agents, whether they be viral, whether they be um, microbial, bacterial. You know, as a medical microbiologist, which is my background, you know, the, the epidemiologists have been predicting this for years and years and years, and we've had some very close scaves, uh, shaves. We've ignored. Uh, SARS and Mars and Ebola, um, those were dealt with locally. So COVID-19 was all, always going to happen. But really what, what scares me uh, and what it has exposed more, Razwan, is, is the risk of, I mean, my kids, your kids, grandchildren, 
stand a better, a higher chance of dying from a bacterial infection than they do from cancer in the years to come. And some of the, you know, because of bacterial resistance, because of the lack of development, we've had no significant development in antibiotics as an industry since the 60s. Right. Up until messenger RNA vaccines came along, vaccine manufacture, uh, research and development was way, way behind even antimicrobials. And some of these statistics are horrifying. You know, when you read what the WHO have been saying for years, that there is a risk of, you know, 150 million deaths over the next 30 years at a cost of $50 trillion to the economy. So I'm hoping that what COVID has done is wake everybody up, regulators, um, charitable foundations, right. which actually are at the forefront of this, people like the Gates Foundation, but also industry to say, we need to completely rethink our approach to anti-infectives, whether they be vaccines, whether they be antimicrobials, because if we don't, this is going to hit us again. Right, okay. Oh, well, that's interesting you said. So how do you think then looking ahead that affects the supply chain as well then because obviously you said big pharma is now reacting a lot quicker there's a lot more collaboration which is fantastic but obviously in the short term there has been impact on the supply chain and also how does that affect the supply chain in the future as well oh huge massive i mean you know, even pre-covid uh, we were experiencing some of the worst drug shortages in history i think post-covid it's going to be even more challenging I'll just give you one example, uh, Rajan, of, of where, uh, you know, in, if we take India, for example, I go to India a lot. Uh, why? Because a tenth of pharmaceuticals by volume are manufactured from that one country. 50% of global vaccines, 40% of generics supplied to the US industry, uh, USA come from, come from India. 25% of medicines prescribed in the United Kingdom come from India. So it doesn't take a genius to realize that any disruption to that country, that market, has a massive impact. So, you know, in my time in industry, the focus has, was, has always been on supply chain efficiency. It's always been efficiency, efficiency, which is, you know, that kind of just-in-time approach that the automobile industry has applied, we have applied. Um, so that word resilience and surplus to get us over the, the, the tough and rough times has never really been fully considered. So I think the impact on supply chains will be massive. And I'm hoping that companies rethink supply uh, and how their medicines get to the market, whether that is bringing manufacture closer to home yeah. or uh, regulators turn to companies and say you must build in extra surplus in your supply chains but as you and i know uh, extra surplus equals extra cost yeah about to enter the biggest global recession in living memory um is it, can we afford that i would argue covid has said we can we, we must do this um so it's going to be an interesting time but yes massive disruption i think well, there's two things which come from that that actually talking about surpluses and so on. If you go down the road of having surpluses, does uh, drug shelf life have an impact on that? Because certain drugs, you know, can't, you can't have a long shelf life necessarily. Um, so our surplus is possible in those areas. Um, and also, do you think there will be a growth in more local manufacturing now to obviously um, help with the supply chain problem because like you said you know you've seen now you know india and china and so on and countries going we can't get the drugs or they're going to keep those drugs for their own local population so does this mean that you're going to see countries now developing their own farmer industry and manufacturing facilities on a local level i think it's, a, it's an important question um logic would say yes that is not a that is not a uh, a quick option you know i think back to my days at astrazeneca and i look at the you know the manufacturing that was done in, in within the uk taking that as an example 20 25 years ago what we have now is a very 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 small percentage of, of manufacturing within the uk and the same applies for most other countries in europe suddenly turning that around 
um, is a really, really big challenge. So the logic says yes. I think when companies look at the practicalities of doing that um, and the cost of doing that, um, it's going to be interesting to see how they respond. My guess is that we will probably leave it as it is. Um, I hope I'm proven wrong. <laughs> um, but but in, in, in years to come, um, you know, if we stay as we are without any manufacturing capability for antibiotics, when, we fe when we're faced with, with microbial um, um, uh, concerns and infections, you know, I, th I think people are going to think back and say, well, why didn't we do something about it? So logic says it should come back, but the practicalities and costs of doing that um, will, I think, prevent that. I, I, I hope I'm wrong. Okay, cool. All right. Well, look, I know time is um, relatively short. So one final question. What do you think are the th three top skills a leader needs to have uh, to get through this crisis in 2020? I think it's not, it's not just about getting through this crisis. This is, this is, uh, um, what's it, what Winston Churchill's quote, not the beginning. Anyway, it's not the, it's just the end of the beginning, you know, in, it, we, we live in this volatile and certain chaotic and ambiguous world, this VUCA world, and that is here to stay. So this is not just a skill set for the current, this is a skill set for the future. And I'm not going to, sort of run off the usual, you've got to be resilient, you've got to be robust, sure. you've got to be a creative thinker, and you know, you know, all of that goes without saying. What I would say to any leaders listening to this, I would say three things, become, this world of uncertainty is here to stay. So it's about how do I confidently lead in a world where actually I'm not sure what's gonna happen next month, let alone next year. What I would encourage people to develop their skills in, number one, to be really, really, really inquisitive. Um, I think we're all conditioned to think that, you know, the skills that we required last week will do us for the weeks to come. What I'd really encourage people to do is to be more inquiring in, in their outlook, to actually read more extensively, talk to people outside their echo chambers, so they can better understand the challenges that may come yep. later, uh, later on. Secondly, I would encourage people to be far more disruptive. To make progress, you've got to break rules. Um, so I would really encourage people to be more disruptive in their thinking. Sure. And lastly, I would, <coughs> excuse me, I would, I would encourage people to perfect the art and science of asking tough, hard questions. So if you can combine those three, you have a better understanding of that VUCA world which puts you in a better position to lead within it. Fantastic. Well, look, I know time is running out, so I just want to say thank you very much for your time, Martin. If people would like to know more information, how can they find out? How can they get more information on these sort of topics? Well, I did a, um, a LinkedIn post a few weeks ago um, entitled COVID, time for a rethink or time to act differently. So please, I'd encourage people to go on to that, have a read uh, sure. because it is, asking those tough questions and it also encourages people to be engaged in that process um and i've got lots of you know if people want to know i've got as you can judge by the <laughs> library behind you yeah. you know i've got lots of really useful references um so if people are really interested in what it takes to be inquisitive be disruptive and to ask those tough questions just just drop me an email uh, martin lush at nsf.org and i'll send them um uh, that, that reading list fantastic well thank you very much for that well thank you for taking the time out to talk to me um i hope you found that useful if you would like to know more information i will be putting a link to martin's article in the comment box above this video on linkedin um you can also um ask questions of martin in the uh comment section under the video which martin i'm sure will be happy to answer and as Martin said, you can always email him directly as well uh, if you've got more questions. So all I have left for me now is say thank you, Martin, for your time. Thank you My for pleasure. watching, everybody. As always, stay well, stay safe. And until next time, see you soon. Bye-bye.